Um, let me remind you that people that have lab on Tuesday night need to sign up for a demo time before 4.30 on Wednesday. Here's the sheet. About one, two, three, four, five, six groups have signed up. I believe there are nine groups. As you probably know, there is no lecture on Monday. Um, but, and, and Tuesday is still break, but I will open up the lab on Tuesday for anybody that happens to be around. I should open, I'll open it as soon early in the morning as you like. Nine o'clock? Tell you what, if it's not open, stop by my office and I'll open it up. Um, Any time, I get here usually about 7.30. I do have to leave in the afternoon about 1.30. So um, that should be enough hours to get something done. So last lecture, we derived a model. We derived a model for a motor, a sort of transfer function, if you will, for a motor that relates the, the change in speed to the voltage in a phasor sense and the transfer function, or the, the, the Bode plot, if you want, looks something like this, where this is log F, and this is log A. And there's some cutoff frequency corresponding to a natural frequency of the motor. The asymptotic slope here is minus 2 on a log-log plot, corresponding to the fact that at high frequencies, the, the transfer function goes as 1 over omega squared. And so the phase shift at high frequency is minus 180 degrees. So that's sort of where we left off last time. And what we want to do this time is to now go through the math for controlling the motor, given that we have a model for the motor. Okay? And, but are there any questions up to this point about the motor model? So what we're going to do then is we're going to we're going to build a control system that takes some desired speed so this is what you're going to set on the keyboard 1101 rpm take some desired speed and subtracts off the actual measured speed. So we're going to have some sort of control system here as yet to be determined. We have the motor function theta dot over V vector function. We have coming out of here then the actual speed And we're feeding back the actual speed and subtracting it from the desired speed. So there's going to be some error signal going into the control system that we're trying to minimize. And we want the motor to be at the same speed independent of which unit you happen to pick up on a given day, and they all have different characteristics, independent of the load you put on the motor, so if you drag your fingernail on the hub, 
the motor should speed up until it's at the correct RPM. Uh, if you load it in other ways, it should stay at constant speed. Your question? Yeah, okay. So, so what we're going to, so we're going to, we, we want some C of F, sine wave frequency, that gives us a reasonable response, reasonable meaning that the response should be quick, it should be accurate, and this of course should be stable. You don't want the system to start oscillating. So if we represent this, this ratio here as the motor as a function of frequency, this theta dot over V that we derived last time, we call this the input and this the output, the actual speed is the output. Then we can write the output as error, error signal times C of F times M of F. But the error is just in minus out. So we can rearrange this to read that the output is equal to the input times C M over 1 plus the vector function C times M. Oh, that's interesting. That says that if you make the magnitude of, of the C, C times M function big enough, the output will equal the input because the one becomes negligible. That says that independent, if you can get the gain high enough, then independent of the motor dynamics, the actual speed will be equal to the speed that you set. Well, that's cool. It also says that for any finite gain, there will be a static error. So if you have a finite gain and you step the speed from, say, 500 to 1,000 RPM. By the way, that is going to be one of the steps that is tested by the TAs. A step from 500 to 1,000 RPM that the speed is going to change but will always be slightly less than 1,000 RPM as long as the gain of this function is finite because of the one in the denominator. So that says turn up the gain. So why not? Well, there's a competing feature here and that is that Remember, this motor curve looks like this. So if you, what it means to turn up the gain is to raise this function higher and higher without changing its shape. Sooner or later, you'll get to the point where you have enough gain at enough, with enough phase shift, at 180 degrees phase shift, and the, and the phase shift does go to 180 degrees, that, that this subtraction will become an addition. 
and the system will oscillate. So you turn up the gain Now looking at time and amplitude, you turn up the gain and you go from a response that looks like this to one that looks like this to one that looks like this to one that goes like that and becomes unbounded. Well, no real motor is unbounded, of course. The motor will either stop or it'll go at full speed, but it won't be stable. So there's a balancing act. Low gain means poor accuracy. High gain means instability, as long as we stick with a pure gain. So that says <clears throat> we have to build a control module that is slightly more sophisticated than just saying multiply the error times some gigantic number and use that as the output. And what do we need to do? We need to, we need to dump some of this phase shift out here. There's too much phase shift. We need to make the phase shift less. And we could do that by How could we do that? at a zero, or if you like to think in, in, in terms of uh, uh, time domain, at a differentiator. So let's say that we, we have a motor, again, the motor characteristic looks like this. Let's say that we added in a differentiator or a high pass filter, really, that cuts in and has a slope of plus one, starting at about the same frequency as the slope of the, as the motor starts dropping off towards the slope of minus two. Now the asymptotic slope of the product of these is going to be minus one. <coughs> and that's stable at minus 90 degrees. So if we draw out the little more detail now, so we're going to abstract this slightly and say the motor is just drops off like this. We're turning everything into straight lines. We're going to add a function which looks like this and has a phase shift that goes from 0 to plus 90 degrees. This is 0 to minus 180. Now the slope out here, the net slope of the product of these will be uh, minus 90 degrees, minus 1. But at low frequency, <clears throat> the system should look like a gain. So it's flat at low frequency, flat frequency response at low frequency, and then it starts to look like a differentiator at high frequency. So we could just then write out that the control function, now in time, this is not as a function of frequency, but in time, the control function might be some proportional term times the error plus some d term, some constant, times d error dt. And depending on the ratio of p and d, this system will be, will be relatively flat at low frequency, say if d is small with respect to p 
will be flat at low frequency, but where the air starts to change rapidly, then there will be a derivative term that becomes significant. So the system will generate a positive phase shift at high frequency to cancel part of the, the, the high slope at high frequency, high negative slope at high frequency. Any questions about this? And of course, to, to make this computable on a finite machine, we're going to replace this with some d times an approximation of the first derivative. Let's just say an Euler approximation. You could do better, but it's probably good enough. Which is going to be the error at time step n minus the error at time step n minus 1 divided by delta t. where delta t is going to be the time interval at which you compute the first derivative. Now, there's a couple of different strategies for this. One is you could compute an update at a uniform rate, say 100 times a second, in which case delta t becomes a constant. You don't have to divide by it. You can multiply by the reciprocal of the constant. or you could do an update every time a fan blade goes by, which is when you have new information. And then you will have an irregular delta t, which will vary with the RPM of the motor. As long as you are consistent, everything is good. So, so what you're asking is, could you, could you compute the derivative at a fairly high rate and then use a so? You want to sample at a high rate, but average. Yeah, you want to sample at a high rate, but average. There, yes, you could do that. And one way to do that is to use a better estimator than an Euler estimator here. You can do a Taylor series expansion, <clears throat> or more likely look up, Google up approximations of the first derivative operator in, in, in discrete time. And you will find piles of different algorithms, all better than this, in terms of averaging. It'll be the, the error of the first two minus plus the error in the second two terms. So it'll be, it'll be some smoothing function that goes through several points. So you get a more noise-free uh, estimate of the first derivative, but you also slow down response time by doing that. Because since these filters are operating in real time, they must all be causal. You know causal? You know, every, you know about causal filters and acausal filters and does that ring a bell? I'm getting a mixed bag here. Okay. So a causal filter only uses information from the past. So adding a derivative term 
a small, relatively small derivative term, that is to say d is going to be small, will help the stability of your motor controller. It'll keep it from oscillating as much at high frequencies, particularly as the gain gets higher. And you're going to have to tune this. So you're going to build this thing, and everybody's going to use a slightly different algorithm, so you're all going to tune it differently. But, but effectively, what you're going to do is you're going to start turning up the gain, the proportional gain, until you start to get some oscillation. Then you're going to throw in a little bit of derivative term and see if, see if you can stabilize it again. But what about this static air? What if we were to also, now this, this so the derivative term is term, talking about stability on a quick change here. But what about the static air in the steady state? Can we do anything about that? The answer is yes. You could say, well, we'll, we'll add yet another term. We'll add yet an, another term to this. which is going to be related to the integral from zero crossing or, sh or I should say from from the set value crossing from zero error crossing to the current value of some error and if we add in a term like, that's like an error, <clears throat> like an integral of an error, then we should be able to slowly, we need a constant of proportionality here, i, we should be able to slowly minimize this, gain, this uh, static error. So, you're probably going to want to have all three terms in there. Yes? Why does it reset on the set It does. Very good. It does. If you reset it at the zero crossing, it does tend to, well, there's, a, there's another piece of this that I haven't said yet, but I'll now I'll, I'll have to say it now, and that's good. And that is that the motor controller that we have <clears throat> cannot produce a negative voltage, nor can you change the polarity of the voltage on these motors because they are brushless motors and have a small sensor in them, and you, if you reverse the polarity on the motors, they explode. Produce a very bad smell. At least one group last year did that. So, I bought some spares, but... Um, so when the error is, so we have to, to modify this slightly and say when the error is greater than or equal to zero, well, strictly greater than zero, we're going to use this function. And when the error is less than or equal to zero, we're going to set C of T equal to zero. We can't slow the motor down. We can speed it up because we can put power on it. We can turn off the drive and the motor will slow down because there's no voltage applied to it. So you can speed up under power, but you can only decay with the passive time constant of the motor. The system is nonlinear. It's piecewise linear, but it is nonlinear. So this makes the resetting problem for an integral very bad because let's say, let's say that we have a static error that's this big. Static error due to gain limitations. We start creeping up 
with an integral, we cross the, 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 the desired set speed. We can no longer, we can't slow the system down. If we just reset the integral to zero, it falls back to this velocity and then starts up again. You get this funny little sawtooth effect of the system bouncing back and forth. So the solution is don't reset it to zero, reset it to 90%. So, so now the system creeps up, creeps up, creeps up, goes over, drops back to 90%, creeps up, goes over, drops back to 90%, goes over. You get a little tiny sawtooth around the, around the desired set point. So what you're going to end up doing, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up choosing an integral gain term and a reset value. You're not going to reset it to zero at the zero crossing or at the zero error crossing. You're going to reset it to something like 90 or 95 percent. The best I've seen over the years was a motor controller that would hold a thousand RPM plus or minus one. We will, we will say that the system is operating quite well if you're within 10 RPM and 1,000 RPM. So we're going to be looking at the static air. We're going to be looking at the transient response from 500 to 1,000 and 1,000 back to 500. And we're going to be looking at the steady state response at 500 and 1,000. RPM. <clears throat> Not going to ask you to go to very low RPM. Why? <coughs> Pardon me? <coughs> there are some nonlinear frictions effects, but that's not the main reason. The sample rate is low because the blade rate, the blade rate is low, exactly. And the whole system becomes less stable and harder to control at low, at low speed, so we're going to eliminate that. It turns out that the motor at 12 volts, you're going to be using the bench supplies for the motor with no connection at all to the microcontroller side. Remember, this is isolated. So you can use the bench supply for the plus 12. As if you just hook plus 12 to the motor, you'll find that it runs right around 3,000 RPM. So as you approach 3,000 RPM, the system becomes harder to control because you can't go by there. So 1,000 is a reasonable place to try and control the system. There's still plenty of headroom for control. We're not, we're not trying to make this impossible. It's hard enough as it is. So steady state response at 500, transient response to 1,000. Did it oscillate? How accurate is it? How much did it overshoot? <coughs> steady state response at 1,000, and then transient, uh, transient back down to 500. To tune the system, to figure out what's going on, you're going to have to plot two variables while you're debugging. <laughs> This is not something you do because it's on the checkoff list that the TA is going to look at. This is something you do because it will help you solve the system faster. So it's the first thing you do. You make a display either on the TFT or on a oscilloscope, your choice, of the control function C of t. and the actual motor RPM. And you need to plot both of those before you start tuning the system, not just for demo. This will save you so much time. C of T is going to be output as a PWM signal. C 
CFT is going to be output as a PWM signal. If you were to feed that through an integrator, oh, I mean a low pass filter, in averager, you could hook that to the scope directly. So it's negligible work to set that up. Do it immediately. RPM. RPM. Oh, you have a you have a frequency, you have a pulse train coming in from the from the sensor that gives you the RPM exactly. Can you put that out on the oscilloscope? By using the same trick? Yes, no? You have 55% chance. Well, I tried it. I mean, I did because I said, oh, well, there's another pulse train. I'll just hook it up. It always read the same value 0.1 VDD. Huh. That's because it's not a pulse width modulator, it is a pulse frequency modulation. And so you cannot convert it using a low pass filter to a DC voltage. Time constant here should be about 0 0.1 second. <clears throat> so for the RPM signal, you're going to have to do one of two things. Either plot both of these. Both of them have to be plotted either on the scope or on the TFT, not one and one. You have to convert the RPM to a... PWM signal using another output compare unit. So you're going to get a number. You're going to then use that as the input to a PWM signal. Convert this to pulse width modulation. And then output it, put it through a low pass filter to the scope channel. Or put them both on the TFT. One of the two. Again, don't leave this for last. This is not an afterthought. This is how you're going to solve this thing. The questions. So there's probably going to be a thread running at around 100 hertz or so. Oh, oh yes, I got remember. It. I got. I got to push my stack. I got to talk about lab three a little bit. But uh, on. Uh, for this, you're going to have to have a thread running around 100 hertz. Yeah, let's see, what is the fan blade crossing rate at 1,000 RPM? Well, let's see, at 3,000 RPM, that's uh, 50 revolutions per second. There's seven blades on these fans, so it's 350 crossings per second. So one third of that's going to be around 100 crossings per second. Doesn't make sense to run the thread much faster than 100 or 150 hertz. Ah yes, now pop the stack. Yeah, pop my stack for for lab three. There's a <clears throat> on your compute thread where you're computing the. Did your stack just overflow? Oh, never mind. Uh, when, you're, when you're running a compute thread for the ball positions for lab three, how long are you waiting? How long are you yielding the thread? You have to yield the thread on every compute cycle or all the other threads go dead. How long are you yielding the thread? Why not yield zero for maximum thread co computation rate? Remember, that when a thread is yielded, it's not computing. You want maximum throughput. You want to set the yield time 
to as low as possible. You're not trying to set a rate in this case. If the computation is fast, then the yield time sets a rate. When the computation is slow, the computation rate computation sets the rate. So you need to minimize the yield time on the compute thread for lab three. So what do you have it set to? Millisecond. Anybody still have it set to 30? Don't do it. It'll have the number of balls you can handle. Yes? Why not just say yield? PT yield. Don't say wait and tell, just say yield. So if you do, if you use the thread yield, then the scheduler will go out and say, is anybody else ready to run? Does anybody want to run? If not, comes back and does it again. I found it helpful to uh, kind of have a two-thread structure. One thread is a frame rate limiter. And it, all it does is it yields for 30 milliseconds or something like that. Uh, and then it signals on a semaphore telling you that uh, the other thread that it's time to, to try again. So it can, it can chain up some extra you know, threads or, or whatever, depending on. You know. So it basically it limits the frame rate. I see. So you so you have so you you can make the thread thread rate deterministic without wasting time. That's that's very nice. I like it. There is a MATLAB program pop stack back to lab four. Uh, there's a MATLAB program that pr simulates this system fairly well. It simulates first order, first order uh, exponential decay of the motor with two different time constants, one for active, one for passive. It, uh, it uh, allows you to set a PI and D term. It allows you to play with the constants and see what they do in a fashion much faster than programming the microcontroller, but don't take it too literally because, because there are some nonlinear friction effects on the real motors that I did not bother to model. And there's all kinds of limit effects of you can't go too slow or too fast. So play with the MATLAB, but ultimately you're going to set this system up. You're going to look at your two displays of RPM and C of T. And you're going to tune the system so that the PW, so that RPM changes crisply and stably, stays at a stable value, drops back to a stable value. That's the goal. This is mostly electronics, folks, not mostly programming. Let me say again, as I did last time, that pin 22 is used by the serial port as a receive pin. And it is also used by, in the default library, by tftmaster.c as SD01 as the SPI output line channel 1. And you want to remap that to another pin. You want to leave the serial pin on pin 22 because pin 22 is 5 volt tolerant. And some, but not all, of our serial adapter cables are 5 volt output cables. If you hook the 5 volt output cable to a pin on the CPU that is not 5 volt tolerant, it disappears. 
So stick with pin 22. Or, if you can't, absolutely can't tolerate that, at least follow the directions on the web page and include a resistor to limit the current. How's the write-up going for the final project? <coughs> Any questions on that? Wow. Quiet class today. I would say for lab four, you can have one lab partner building the sensor side, the other lab partner building the motor control side. You can test the motor control. Remember that the motor control, the motor control is going to be controlled by an I.O. pin, which is either going to be at plus three point three or it's going to be at zero. That's pretty easy to simulate using a power supply. So you could test the whole motor control circuit or, uh, or in fact with the signal generator. That'd be even better because that allows you to do a pulse width modulation. So you could, do, you could test the whole, the whole motor drive circuit using nothing but the signal generator as input, get that completely debugged independent of anything else. You can debug the sensor the same way. You're going to have you're going to have a gain stage, a comparator with the light shining again through the blades, not all bouncing off the hub, shining through the blades. You can debug that completely to the point of producing a square wave output on the oscilloscope. Once you have a three volt square wave coming out of that, you could be pretty sure that it's going to trigger the capture input of the microcontroller. So there's no reason not to build these in parallel. Get some throughput. So what do we need to talk about next for lab four? Well, we still need to talk about <clears throat> a little more about serial communication and maybe a little bit more about yeah, maybe a little more about isolation, but not too much. So let's wait till Wednesday. Yes. So how do you convert from uh, RPM? So RPM is pulse frequency. To convert to pulse width modulation, you could turn on a separate output compare unit. There's going to be one output compare unit, which is, have I talked about this yet? Yeah, output, yes, I did talk about output compare units, but I haven't shown you any code recently. Oh, well, we could do that for a minute. <clears throat> I'll at least show you where it is. So on the protothreads page, there is a now an output compare example, which starts two output compare units connected to the same timer and generates a, a, a pulse with two pulse width modulated signals. And the, the only thing, there's only one real thread here, and that's the serial control thread, which allows you to set the 
period of the timeout of the timer and the on time of the PWM. Setting the on time of the PWM and the period of the timer gives you the duty cycle on time over period and therefore it gives you the average value of the square wave. The more the on time, the bigger the duty cycle, the higher the average value. And what you're going to do is you're going to convert the RPM, you have to convert the RPM to a number to display it on the, on the liquid crystal display, on the TFT. You may as well use that same number or a scaled version of that number as the PWM on time. Which will then convert the frequency into a duty cycle or percentage on. So that does the that does the conversion to PWM. No, the, the, the period is going to be the period of the timer here is going to be effectively the resolution of your PWM. So if you set the period to a thousand say 1,024, then you'll have effectively a 10-bit PWM, pulse width modulator. You can set the on time from 0 to 1023, and you will go from 0% on to 100% on, and therefore the average of the waveform will go from 0 volts to 3.3 volts. integrated over one cycle. So the time constant of the integration here has to be large compared to one cycle of the PWM to get an accurate signal. The, the opto-isolator is limited to about a thousand hertz on its PWM channel. So if you run the PWM at a thousand hertz, uh, you could get reasonable attenuation reasonable integral if you set the time constant here to one a tenth of a second. So you're going to, all you need to do is start up a timer, hook a couple of output compare units to the timer. In this case that's done down in Maine. <clears throat> you start the timer. The interrupt is turned on on this timer solely for debugging this code. You do not have to turn on the timer, which is controlling the P timer interrupt, which is controlling the PWM channel. We're opening two output compare units. Thank you. Apple. Apple really wants me to install this update that, as far as I can tell, does nothing for me. The last one wiped my uh, PowerPoint um, presentations. Um, you're going to open two output compare channels, both linked to the two, the same timer. You're going to open one in PWM mode and open the other one in continuous pulse mode that allows you to not only pulse width modulate, but pulse phase modulate. You can move the pulse back and forth inside of the timer period. So you can do phase modulation as well as pulse width modulation with these compare units. I'm not asking you to do that with this particular lab, but you could. That's all you got to do to turn on the, the output compare units. We'll, we'll talk about this again next week.